So hello and welcome. My name is Steve Nabell, and today I'm speaking with Susie Ashworth on her book, Infinite Receiving. And Susie is a single mum of three children. That's a hero's journey, of course. A high school dropout. Very good. Author of Sunday Times bestselling book, Infinite Receiving, which I've got. Uh, Susie is a success coach who certifies coaches, helping them go from good to great, world class, she says. And her vision is to use the infinite receiving framework to help people be more of who they were put on the planet to be, creating more freedom, joy, abundance and peace, one infinite receiver at a time. So hi, Susie. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Our pleasure. It's really, really nice to have you. Um, can I ask you about your journey before you wrote the book? You know, were yeah. you... Did you leave school thinking I'm going to be an author and a coach or was something else happening? Yeah, <laughs> definitely something else was happening. I dropped out of school at 16 and basically worked in every single pizza restaurant in my local area. And the way that I talk about that time, it's really just my self-esteem was through the floor. I didn't have much ambition at all. And so there were a lot of recreational drugs. There was a lot of looking for love in all of the wrong places. And I was really on a fast road to nowhere. And it is only the fact that I had a real jolt from the universe at age 19, when my foster mother passed away, that I uh, really took a step back and was like, what are you doing with your life? Oh, and what happened then after that jolt? Did you go off training, exploring? What did you What did you do? You left pizza restaurants. I left pizza restaurants. I um, uh, I I left the UK actually. I went travelling oh. for four years, and I kind of grieved my way around the world. Um, I went to Ibiza and Amsterdam and Bangkok and Amsterdam. So we can, from those locations, you can kind of get a, maybe a gist of what the... So Are you a partying? Slightly, <laughs> slightly hedonistic lifestyle. And at the same time, my eyes were opened up because I met people who were doing things like spending the summer in Ibiza and then the winter in India. And they were living this freedom lifestyle. And I was like, oh, there is a big wide world out here. Because up until that point, I'd been, like my holidays were like Barry Island in Wales. And I'd been on one 18 to 30s holiday to Lorette de Mar when I was like 17. So I had no idea. And then I was meeting these people who were living these extraordinary lives for me. And I thought, I want a piece of this. And yeah. so, yeah, I stayed away for four years until my foster father got sick. And then that was my prompt to come home and um, um, I suppose grow up a little bit. <laughs> well three children i suppose will also help i guess that did yeah for sure <laughs> and i would say that was probably the next pivotal moment in my journey getting pregnant with my son because at that point i had been working in media for maybe 11 years i was working at the guardian um uh, when i got pregnant with him and i was selling advertising space and i was quite good at that job yeah. Um, but I, as soon as I found out I was pregnant, it, I don't know where it came from, but as soon as I found out I was pregnant, I knew that I wanted to be able to say to him, you can do anything that you want in this world. And I also intrinsically knew that it wouldn't really mean anything, me saying that if I was still working at The Guardian, because The Guardian didn't really mean anything to me. And so... It was, it was a job that I could go in at nine, clock out at five. I never had any drama. I never brought it home. There was never anything to say. It just, I was just, I was doing what I needed to do. And so it, that's where the seed was planted to do something different. But I didn't know what I was going to do or supposed to do. And actually it took me getting pregnant with my second child, Coco, um, to actually leave I was like if I don't do this now I'm never going to do it so it was like what am I going to do and it was pretty much finger in the air 
It was yeah. like, I just, I didn't feel very academic. I was still running the story that I was quite unintelligent at that point. And so I just wanted a practical course that didn't involve me reading too much that I could get a new qualification in. And I retrained as a hypnotherapist and a psychotherapist. I did a diploma in hypnotherapy and solution focused psychotherapy. And that really changed my life. And that, I guess, led into the coaching world. Not straight away. I, the first thing I did was hypnobirthing. And I, because I had, I've had all three of my children at home in the water, but the first wow. two, I did a method called hypnobirthing, so, which is essentially how to have calm and positive birth experiences. And with my second birth, I literally gave birth and had no pain. And I was like, oh my goodness, this is incredible. <laughs> and Amazing. so I decided that I would become a hypnobirthing instructor and created the world's first video-based hypnobirthing program called the Calm Birth School. Right. And I, uh, I loved that. But what was interesting is that what I realized is whilst all my peers were obsessed with babies and boobs and vaginas and birth I was obsessed with business and branding and marketing and so I started teaching people in the birth world how to make money online and that's when the coaching came in okay well let's talk about your book because what did all this naturally lead to your book infinite receiving um I think that when I look at my life, the seeds for infinite receiving were sown right from the beginning. Because my, you know, the book is called Infinite Receiving Crack the Code to Conscious Wealth Creation. And most people pick it up because they want to earn more money and they want to learn how to manifest the life of their dreams. And what I was shown throughout my entire life is that you can create more of what you want. Anybody can create more of what they want, but most people are trying to get more stuff because they don't feel worthy and deserving. Yeah. And so much of my early years, I did not feel worthy or deserving. I knew how to get stuff, I knew how to push, and I knew how to force, but I didn't trust myself, I didn't trust the universe, I didn't really trust people, my heart was pretty closed, and so uh, but I had my mum and my dad, my foster father and my foster mother, who really instilled many of the messages that as an adult I have used to create something quite extraordinary and one of the messages that I had right throughout my childhood was this idea of why not why not you why don't you do this mm. and they were yeah. they were an interesting beast because they were never really that impressed by results or impressed by really anything but they also had this kind of like when I wanted to play the cello even though we didn't have the money to have cello lessons they were like well why not and so she, my mum would go and find a way to kind of get a grant or get a scholarship and so I played the cello same with the flute same with the ski trip and so this kind of why not has been so helpful for me now when it comes to having these big dreams and big visions and creating um, um you know creating a life that i feel deeply proud of yeah. you know one of the things that i talk about in the book are what well, four of the things the four pillars so the pillar of love the pillar of support the pillar of greatness and the pillar of limitless co-creation you know my again my mother and father really showed me what it was like to live life with an open heart and yeah. now as a mother I am uh, 
so grateful for the love that was demonstrated that I didn't realize that I was receiving at the time. Yeah. But it is that model that I have used to really open myself up. And it's so interesting because I lived really the first 40 years of my life with my heart very closed because I was fostered at the age of three months old. And I didn't realize that I, that was my first heartbreak. And I went through life very, like, wanting to protect my heart. I didn't want to get my heart broken again. So on yep. the outside, I was very smiley and happy and extrovert. And everybody thought that I was such a great person. And I, and I was a nice person, but you couldn't get in. Yeah. You know, which means that when you can't, when you're walking around with your heart closed, it means that you can't be truly authentic. Yeah. It means that you cannot be truly vulnerable. You know, and so in business, the people who are the most successful are the people who are willing to say, I'm going all in on this. Yeah. And not know what the answer is going to be, not know if you're going to be rejected, not know if people are going to say, Yes, I'm in. You know, when it comes to having relationships, being an intimate relationship, and that's my next kind of foray as it were you can't have a love story for the ages if you are not willing to really have your heart broken to really be rejected because that only happens when you're willing to go all in and yeah. so there's been such a um, journey of softening and opening and as my heart has opened more i've been able to receive so much more because that cycle is that you know you give and you receive you give and you give and you receive and yeah. so that that's been a really big thing for me but it sounds like the book isn't just about getting stuff getting bigger more successful shinier it's also about living a fuller authentic happy open life yeah. is that right on one thousand percent more joy more peace more of a feeling of security and safety yeah you know it's like people say often well i want to be earning five thousand a month ten thousand a month whatever mm. your number is and then i'll feel safe and secure and what i have seen through the hundreds of people that i've worked with closely and then thousands of people that i've worked with um at a distance is is that even when people get the money they then feel afraid that they're never going to be able to sustain it and yeah. That's not a great place to be living your life from. You want to know that if you have the money or don't have the money, you're, you, you are safe, you are secure. And yeah. what the book does is teach people how to access that sense of safety and security, which in turn means that you makes it that much easier for you to manifest the money, the partner the whatever it is that you desire because you're not coming from a place of scarcity and not enoughness yeah i used to work in the city of london actually you know there was a lot of money there a lot of you know bonuses and everything but i saw the the formula of more money must equal more happiness didn't work didn't, because it, work. more money didn't necessarily necessarily mean people were more happy there was this as you say chasing but there was almost like trying to fill a hole that could never be filled but it seems yeah. like what you're saying is kind of do the work on yourself open do the stuff around self-worth because i know in your book you talk about three aspects of self-worth yeah. um do the work and then when you receive it can be from a place of fullness i guess that's what you're saying yeah 100 percent. in the book i talk about the wealth trifecta and most people when we talk about wealth immediately go to money and i call that leverageable wealth but the other two aspects of that trifecta are our intrinsic wealth so how we feel our safety and security on the inside our connection to ourselves our higher selves god the universe and then extra experiential wealth and that is our experience of life it's like 
what is the point of earning all of the money in the world if you are working 18 hours a day and never get to see your friends, your family, the people that you care about? That's not wealth. And if you, you know, I attract a lot of people who have a desire to create a big impact in the world. And it's like, if you can feel safe and secure, that's amazing. If you're kind of driving around in your RV and kind of renouncing money and, you know, you can do that, but it's very difficult for you to then have the impact that you desire. So for me, it's not, not one or the other. It is always the and. And we yeah. get to work on all three parts of the wealth trifecta simultaneously, actually. Oh, that's brilliant. Mm -hmm. I, I did look through the book and I, I, I mean, I've got the book and I, I was, I pulled out a number of things that really caught my eyes. One of the things that said, one of the biggest things I've worked on and continue to work on every day is the constant and continual shifting of my identity. How we see ourselves determines our experiences for better or worse. Our self-image influences what we allow into our lives, our perception of worthiness and how much we believe we deserve. I guess mm. a lot of people um, struggle or, or go, well, my belief has got nothing to do with it or my identity has got nothing to do with it. But clearly you're saying it does. Got everything to do with it. You know, how you look at yourself and how you see yourself absolutely determines what you'll ask for. You know, yeah. what you feel that you are, or what you feel that you're deserving of. You know, the person who sees themselves as not very high value will absolutely tolerate less in all of their relationships, whether it's intimate, whether it's friendships, whether it is the dynamic that you have between yourself and your employer. If you don't yeah. see yourself as worthy, or if you see yourself as a high value individual, you know, I talk about the pillar of greatness. And that is knowing that just by you being born, without you doing a thing, the fact that you are the only person on this entire planet that has your unique blueprint makes you great. And that is a, it's such a interesting concept for people to get their head around and I talk about it in relation to babies if you've ever had a child and I say you know does your child does your brand new baby need to speak before they're valuable people laugh at me I'm like how much would you give me for your brand new baby it's like my baby is priceless you understand it as a newborn child looking at that, looking at their brilliance before they can speak, before they can roll over. What they can do is wee and poop and cry. And we're like, you are amazing. And then we forget that that child was us, is us. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. And when you can start from the basis of understanding that your presence is a gift like you being on this interview is a gift me being here is a gift when you show up knowing that it changes the energy that you speak from it changes mm. what it is that you're saying and what is really interesting is is that it changes the way that people respond to you so that knowing that you are inherently worthy is an absolute identity thing. And every single time you go for a new goal, something that is perceived as bigger, your identity has to up level in alignment with the new level of receiving that you're asking for. So for me, identity is everything. It's everything. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I want to ask you something specific. It's, um, I mean, you've traveled. I, I used to work, as I mentioned, alternatives when we promoted British authors, a lot of American authors. What I notice, and I mean, I've got British clients and American clients, and I notice this cultural difference. And I want your perspective on it. It's in, in England, I think we're very humble. We're like, oh, I'm sorry to bother you. Um, do you mind if I send you an invoice? It's kind of like if we're in business, a therapist or healer or coach, <clears throat> we have this kind of humble. In America, it's very different. It's like, hey, I'm the one blowing my trumpet. And what I've noticed and I, 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 is that in England, there's a tendency to slightly maybe undercharge. But in America, they're like, well, if you're worth money, you're going to triple your triple your fees. Where do you feel in this in this kind of cultural difference? Yeah. 
I agree with your observation. I went to a networking event in Austin recently and I was really like, whoa, it was like, <laughs> that's just great <laughs> in your face. It's like numbers. Yeah. It's like, it's cool. It's mm. a lot. For me, though, the important thing is, is the energy that somebody is coming from. And it doesn't matter if somebody is like, I'm charging triple my rates, if the energy is coming from a place of scarcity, if the energy right. is coming from a place of I'm not really worthy or I need to get all of this because I'm stockpiling for my future, Yeah, you know? Yeah. Where we want to come from is this place of wholeness, you know? Mm. And it's like, I will charge what I believe the value of this transformation is mm. and so uh, and and that is what it is what it is and I don't need to apologize for it I don't need to over inflate it it's like this is the value of the transformation it's also the value that I put on my time which is the only finite resource that there is on the planet Absolutely. and it's like so this is how much I value my time. If you value it the same and you value it the same as a transformation, you've got a deal. And if yeah. we don't, then uh, I trust that there are there is somebody on this planet for everybody when it comes to our work. And in my industry, the coaching industry, there's a coach for everyone. So there is somebody who loves to charge £10 an hour for their services. And there are people who love to charge £100,000 for their packages. And your job is to find the person who you are in most alignment with. Great answer. Thank you. <laughs> so can I ask you, you, you've got the book and I know you've got a coaching business. What's what are you up to? What what else are you doing? What's the plan? I know you talked about another possible uh, uh, book on possibly love relationships, was it? Yeah, I would love, I've got two books. I want to do infinite receiving specifically on money. And then I want to do infinite receiving specifically on love. And I am uh, allowing life to work its magic through me. And when the time is right, those books will be written. Um, but really for me, my happiest place is really having the opportunity to work with people in person. I love events and I love retreats. And I believe now with the shift that we're seeing just generally in the world when it comes to AI and technology and robot, that there's never been a more important time and a better time and a time for where people like me braving real life connection and interaction. And so when I envisage the future, it is way more opportunities for people to eyeball each other and give inappropriately long hugs and touch each other and just be in communion and community with each other. That's fantastic. Well, look, Susie, it's been great chatting to you. And I'm, I'm going to be putting out all of your social media and website links with this podcast. So I guess you're on Instagram and all these other places. So I'll, I'll let everyone know about that. So one final word, Susie, on message to the world. I have two. My, okay. my, my, the first one is faith plus action equals miracles. I have that written right throughout the entire book. And yeah. that affirmation and intention changed my life. And really, it just means believe in yourself and take action in alignment with that belief and your mind will be blown. And the second thing is, is that actually you can get the book for free right now. So you just go to susieashworth.com book for the word F-O-R free and um, you just pay for postage and packaging and we'll send you out a copy. So if this oh. has been a vibe for you, then yeah, I'd love to, for you to read more. Fabulous. Susie, I hope we'll meet again soon for a, a, a long, uh, appropriate hug or inappropriate yeah. hug, whatever. Thanks very much. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, pleasure.